Okay, I think we can get started. Can everybody hear me? Hello? All right, I am going to get started with our webinar today. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me before I get started. How is everybody saying yes? Great. Okay, super. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the FLAVA webinar on why interculturality is at the heart of learning languages. My name is Janet Parker, and I would like to share with you what I have learned on my journey of investigation into and reflection on the concept of interculturality as it applies to teaching and learning in your classrooms. For the past 17 years, I have been teaching the World Language Education Program, the Master's Preparation and Licensure Program at the College of William & Mary. I'm a language consultant for Wayside Publishing, and I have taught kindergarten through higher ed, mostly the high school level, as a Spanish teacher in Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm a co-author of Tejidos, a pre-AP Spanish program, and my co-authors are two of my former William & Mary students. This is an interactive session. I have built in opportunities for you to interact, share, and collaborate with the other participants at your location. Your facilitator will share your comments and questions so that I can re read and respond to them as promptly as possible. I would like to thank my world language colleagues out there, teachers, supervisors, and visionaries in our field that have inspired me to help teachers integrate interculturality into their classroom lessons. Some of these colleagues are noted in the resources at the end of the presentation today. You have two sets of handouts. One is an outline of the topics and activities of the webinar with a little bit of space for some notes. The other handout includes reference documents that you might want to see more closely than on the screen. They will be on the screen, but maybe it would help you to see them in front of you. If you have uh, questions, or comments, let the facilitator know, and she will type them in the chat box. And since this is a live webinar, I will build in a pause break around 5 p.m. And most of all, I want to thank you for spending your precious free time after teaching classes all day to participate in this webinar. Thanks to Dr. Kutner at Washington and Lee University the tech specialist there, and of course, you facilitators at each location. So without further ado, let's begin. And I would just like to say that today as we come together, think of this as an intercultural cafe. I hope you have some snacks and a beverage of your choice so you can feel comfortable talking and sharing with your colleagues during the webinar. Today we will connect and communicate with each other to learn more about interculturality and how we as teachers can integrate intercultural communication activities and reflections in our lessons to guide learners to communicate in culturally appropriate ways in our target languages. Many of you are already doing this, but we still can learn more from each other. I plan to share the most recent documents that the Necessful Actful Task Force has been developing over the last several years. These will help us become more intentional and explicit so students will become accountable as intercultural communicators. You will also be asked to self-assess and share your takeaways at the end of each part of the presentation. There are three parts to the presentation.
All right, and I'm just reading the comments, sorry about that. Um, we have three guiding questions for today. The first one is, what is interculturality? And believe me, there's a lot of definitions, there are a lot of definitions out there. What does interculturality look like in the world language classroom, which is what I'm sure interests most of you, and how can teachers guide learners to develop interculturality? Because we cannot teach it per se. We also have goals for today's webinar. I can explain the concept of interculturality as it relates to cultural knowledge, cultural competence, and language proficiency. I can provide examples of intercultural communication activities so learners can engage in cultural observations, investigations, and reflections that promote awareness and interactions. And finally, I can integrate some customized examples of can-do statements for intercultural communication in my lessons. So three big goals, but I think they're probably the most practical and hopefully applicable to you and your classrooms. To accomplish these goals, we will be observing images and video clips, and you will participate in many tasks. So you will leave with ideas for activities and how to use intercultural reflections in your classroom. And the draft of the can-do statements will pull all this information together so that you can integrate it into your curriculum, units, and lesson plans. And the can-dos are targeted to be released late this summer. I have heard August, but don't quote me on that. So the first part of our webinar today is going to answer the question, what is interculturality? And in this component, we will define interculturality and its connection to the world readiness standards, the global competence position statement, cultural knowledge, language proficiency, intercultural communication, behaviors, and attitudes. So you have a packet that or a handout that has the world readiness standards on the top. You will need to access that in a minute. And we want to know why, where did all this get started, this interculturality? Because I had heard of intercultural communicative competence when I was taking some course on the national standards way back in 1996 from my supervisor, Mimi Met. But the word interculturality never really seemed to pop up in languages until I think probably about 2013 or so when I saw it in uh, Laura Terrell and Donna Clemente's book the key to planning for learning. So when you look at the world readiness standards, these are going to be our roadmap that helps us guide learners to develop competence to communicate effectively and interact with cultural competence to participate in multilingual communities at home and around the world. And obviously that is one of our goal areas in the national standards. But world readiness standards. However, um, what I'd like you to do now is with this handout, just look at the five goal areas and see if you can find any statements that reoccur. And just take about 15, 20 seconds to look at that and jot them down, circle them, whatever you want to do and you can work with a partner, that's perfectly fine for about 15 seconds, 20 seconds.
Okay. So you probably had time to do that now. And I would imagine that you saw the recording phrases interact with culture, cultural competence and understanding. And I'm sure you saw communicate and interact with cultural competence in at least three of the goal areas, cultures, comparisons, and communities. The other piece that I really would think that is worthwhile doing is in scanning the standards, you can scan a look along with me and notice the language that's used to describe what learners are supposed to do. And what does that tell you about the role of the learner? So that let's just look at the starting with the communication standards. What are students or <clears throat> learners doing? They are interacting, negotiating. They are sharing information, reactions, feelings, and opinions. They are understanding, interpreting, and analyzing. They're presenting information, concepts, and ideas to inform, explain, persuade, and narrate. They're, in the cultures, they're using the language to investigate, explain, and reflect. The same in the, with the products and perspectives. And the connections, they're building, reinforcing, and expanding knowledge and developing critical thinking to solve problems. And then they are evaluating information and diverse perspectives through the language and its cultures. And the comparisons, again, investigate, explain, and reflect in both levels of comparisons, language and culture. And finally, in the communities, they are interacting and collaborating in their community and in the world. So all these, this language to me gives the learners a much more active role in their own learning. So think about that when you develop your own, obviously, curriculum, unit goals, and things like that, about using some of this language. So let's go on. Now it's your turn. You are going to um, tell each other, share, what interculturality means to you. And there's no wrong answer, so don't be afraid to say something you think might not be right. It's, there's no wrong answers to this question. So take two minutes and have a conversation, at least with a partner or maybe a small group of three or something like that. And the facilitator, if you want to jot down any comments along the way that you hear, um, that would be great. We could share them with everyone. OK, two minutes.
You have about 15 seconds left. Okay, so stop for now. And I'll see if anybody, oh good, I have some comments. Interculturality is the connection between two cultures, whether it's connecting to your own or connecting to two countries. Being able to recognize the differences between cultures, learning about different cultures, connecting the cultures for students with their feet in two cultures, helping them join the cultures, appreciating the beauty of cultures. Super. <clears throat> Skills of discovery and interaction, good words. Aware of differences, understanding, comparison between countries within a country. Effective and appropriate interaction across cultures. Interact effectively between cultures. So we're getting a lot of good ideas and what it means. And we still have a couple more, I think. Okay, let's see. Appreciation, recognition, and valuing of other cultures. We aren't the only content area, by the way, that is talking about interculturality in our disciplines. It seems to be the buzzword, as we say, in many different areas. They might not use it in the relation, the specific context of language learning, but definitely as attitudes that you develop in the classroom. Interaction between and among diverse cultures, be it race, ethnicity, language group, etc. That's somewhat generic for all content areas, everyone how cultures affect each other deliberately and incidentally. Very interesting, that's great. Well, I thank you all for your contributions. It sounds like you had some great conversations. So let's look at some ideas here on what interculturality is. The definition that I heard um, at the Natsville webinar in January was a dynamic process of active participation in communication guided by the awareness and understanding of culture, how to apply knowledge of culture to communication. That's very succinct and really very helpful for teachers and students. Reflect on one's own culture and use those experiences to understand another culture. Discovering culturally appropriate ways to interact with others whose perspectives may be different from your own. And this is part of a vision statement from Wayside Publishing, the Entre Culturas uh, series. We have another aspect of interculturality from Faye Rowling, Rowlings Carter. And she says it's interact with people from different cultural backgrounds using language appropriately. Be open-minded, interested, curious. Evaluate and reflect on personal feelings, thoughts, perceptions, and reactions. So being aware of what we are feeling and perceiving and how we're reacting. So there's so much involved in interculturality. It's very difficult to get your head around. But it goes beyond our world language classrooms, which I think is really great because it helps us cross into those other disciplines. Uh, Kofi Annan says, tolerance, intercultural dialogue, and respect for diversity are more essential than ever in a world where peoples are coming, becoming more and more closely interconnected. 
I thought this was really wise. Kofi Annan, is, as you know, is um, the former diplomat who served as Secretary General of the United Nations. He's from Ghana, and he was a co-recipient with the UN for the 2001 Nobel Peace Prize. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program, but they have a set of attitudes that includes empathy, tolerance, curiosity, appreciation, and respect. And to me, that's interculturality as well, that mindset of attitudes. So whether we want to or not, we should be developing those attitudes or modeling them so that our students also develop them. So finally, moving on here, I wanted to, I thought that I would be remiss if I did not reference the actual global competence position statement. This and the role it played in the development of the world readiness standards, because it was actually written in response to the uh, global competence, the critical component of education in the 21st century. There's national initiatives in pre-K through 12, focused on literacy and STEM. And this was considered an essential learning outcome of the liberal education and America's Promise program of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. So this ACTFL is where ACTFL is also integrating itself into all the other content areas so that we all are working on the same page. And when you get a chance, look at this statement online. We're not going to go over it in this webinar, but these are great things to use in your classroom with your student. What, why it's important to have be globally competent and what it really means. And then of course, what it means in relation to your class and the language that you're teaching. Okay, so graphics. Graphics speak a thousand words better than I can explain it in oral language. So this graphic was created, I believe, by Jackie Van Houten from Jefferson County Public Schools, the world language specialist. And it really visually, I think, sums up some a good visual for us teachers. So just look at it for a minute, turn to a partner, talk for about 15, 20 seconds, and what does this graphic show you? Okay, I think you probably had time to figure this one out quickly. So if you said that the interculturality that a novice learner would show is obviously not as much as obviously the other levels of proficiency, but it is showing the relationship between cultural knowledge and language proficiency. It takes time to develop interculturality. It takes time to develop language proficiency and cultural knowledge. So, but as your language proficiency increases, so obviously does your cultural knowledge and therefore your ability to interact with cultural competence or interculturality as it takes different forms depending on where the student is in their journey. But this intersection shows that interculturality is at the intersection of the language level and the cultural knowledge. And now, just to kind of give it another twist, the Necessful Actful draft has come out with some new graphics, and their can-dos are called 
can do's for intercultural communication. So we're using interculturality as just kind of a, a word to kind of integrate everything that we do related to culture and what we do, but there's also a very strong emphasis on that intercultural communication and what it looks like and what students can do with the language and their cultural competence. Look at this one for a minute. And again, 20 seconds I think will be plenty, but how would you interpret these graphics and how do they differ from the former ones that we just looked at? So you probably said, because the captions are there above the graphics, that you don't have to have necessarily great language proficiency to have cultural competence. It could, it's sometimes inversely related. You can have better language proficiency and less cultural competence or vice versa. And I think that's a great way to look at it because I'm sure you have students that are very culturally sensitive and really know how to act properly and behave appropriately, non-verbally, etc. And yet their language is not very strong. So this is really great for those students that probably are higher on the intercultural scale. So I just think it's, it's a great way to look at how intercultural communication fits in with language and it's not the fact that you know how to speak accurately and can spell things correctly, but it's more than just words and language. But I also have to tell a personal little story that what this graphic reminds me of, an intercultural experience that I had when I was in Spain as a college student. I purchased a Yadra figurine in a nice little shop, gift shop, and later that day I saw the same figurine in another shop that was priced considerably, the same figurine that was priced considerably less. So I wasn't very happy. So I returned to the first shop with the figurine and I said, if you know Spanish, me estafaste, which means you ripped me off. Well, that wasn't very interculturally appropriate because I'll never forget the look of outrage on his face. I had offended him as a proud shop owner. I don't even recall the exact outcome if I returned it or not, but I learned three important lessons that day. And that was to avoid offending the pride of someone in any culture because I could have handled it differently. I could have made an excuse and returned it and said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I." The person I was giving it to already has this one. I also used the familiar form of tu and not the formal usted with a clearly elder person than I who was a stranger. And also that was pretty strong language and it's also considered somewhat slang. So I got three strikes on that experience and like I said, I can remember it as if it were yesterday, and that was many years ago. So those are just little things that we can help our students possibly avoid if they learn to know that maybe they can speak the language, but it's not always the words that matter. That matter. It's how they're delivered, your body language, your tone of voice, your facial gestures. So I'm sure we can all think of times when we made a faux pas and it might not even have been with our words, but it could have been with the body language or tone of voice. So, um, and again, interculturality, just to kind of reiterate this over and over again, it is something that is developed over time. And it's 
gradual and also cyclical. So therefore, the more students can think and reflect about the culture that they're learning, the more likely they will be able to develop that sense of interculturality. So now we're going to see what it looks like in the real world. And it's going to be a little video. But while you're watching the video, it's about three minutes, you're going to notice some characteristics and qualities of this young man in the products, practices, interactions with the people. So happy viewing, and you can take some notes on your handout. So check this out. It's Trevor James, and today I'm at a super busy morning market here in Changju. Right near the 8 a.m. We're going deep. We're gonna go check it out. Nihao. This is Mao Dofu, right? And then, what kind of thing? Where is the Dofu? Oh, this is... Oh, check this out. This is Mao Dofu, right? Okay, so we got ding ding tong. This is an awesome snack here. Oh, look at the ding ding tong. So, this is Oh, yes, 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 yes. What a great start to the morning. Oh, you're gonna use this, right? No, no, no. It's awesome. Thank you, thank you. This is your Oh, oh. I want to try this. Okay. I gotta try here, okay? Oh. It's good. It's good. It's good. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's super chewy. Mmm. That sesame is really nice. Mmm. Mmm. But the first thing in the morning, I'm gonna go see what else there is in this place. Yeah. This is a tooth, right? One tooth is a tooth. Six hundred dollars. Ah, how? That's awesome. They got it all. Okay, look at all these chickens. An insane amount of chickens here. I'm not gonna buy a rabbit here though. <laughs> this is so busy. Oh my god. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, this is Yeah, I can't sit. That's liver. Anyhow. This is what? This is what? This is what? This is Okay. 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 Oh, it's still warm. Beautiful. Ah, okay, I'm gonna try it out. Oh. Oh. Oh, it's super, super sticky and brittle and and sweet. That's amazing. This is a crazy market. This is a crazy market. I'm telling you. Look at this. Ni hao. 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 Ni Great. So in any case, I had to have something from another language besides some Spanish examples for you. But I thought this was really showed um, some great qualities and characteristics of intercultural communication. Um, it's interesting, the background, and some of you may know that uh, Trevor James is a Canadian who, when he graduated from high school, traveled in China for four months, and then he decided to take study Chinese at, the, at college because he needed an elective. Now, 
10 years later, he's living in Chengdu and he's becoming a, learning how to be a Sichuan chef. But he said, as he passed through Chengdu, he had a sense of adventure to try whatever was put before him. I felt a connection to the city that made me decide I wanted to move here in the future. There was something magic about it and the way of life in Chengdu was so relaxed and different from many places. So he really kind of bonded, and but he had that attitude. He had those attitudes of the internationally minded, open-minded uh, person who was open to meeting other cultures and learning their languages. So I just thought it was a good example, something that we can share similar things from your own target languages with your uh, with your students. So if you want to chat for about a minute or so on some of the things that you noticed in this video that relates to interculturality. So take a minute and discuss with your partner, small group, what you noticed. Okay, time, that's been about a minute, and this is the, we're coming to the conclusion of the first part of our webinar, and now we have a self-assessment. You also have this self-assessment on your handout at the bottom of the first page of the, hand, the notes, the outline notes, and the can do statement for you is I can explain the concept of interculturality as it relates to cultural knowledge and language proficiency, but basically explain for evidence whether you can do this on your own or with help. Explain interculturality to a partner and jot something down on your notes page. And I'll give you about another minute to do that. Okay, facilitators, uh, continue typing. This is really great. Language proficiency and cultural competence work best together. Being open-minded to compare the difference in regard to geographic location. Open-minded, I like that word. And I'm getting some more responses coming in. But this little self-assessment is exactly what you would be using with your students. When they're doing a reflection on what's 
like being intercultural related to the content that they're learning. Interaction of people from diverse cultural backgrounds using authentic language appropriately and culturally appropriate behaviors. That's a great summary. It's more than knowledge and more about interacting. That's for sure. I know so many students that can't speak the language very well, but boy, did they make lots of friends. Openness to difference and cultural knowledge plus language proficiency combine to enable participation in an interaction. Openness to differences, cultural knowledge, and language proficiency combine to enable participation in an interaction. Very nice. Making connect, interconnections between cultures. Fully immersing oneself and being open-minded toward the culture. And we're getting a couple more. I hope we can capture all these notes and then that we could send them out to you with the, when the video recording is sent out. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And when I see the other comments coming up, I will share them with you. We have one here says, being able to live the culture allows you to become proficient in language. Yes, that's certainly what that video showed. And we know examples of many people like that here in our country and our communities. All right. so. Part two of our webinar is what does interculturality look like in the world language classroom? Obviously, it's not the real world, but in many ways it is in terms of who is in our classrooms. In this component, you will examine and participate in intercultural activities that engage learners in cultural observations, investigations, and reflections that promote intercultural awareness and interactions. And if you get a chance to look at the little comic, I just thought that was great for a parent to say how to withdraw your allowance. He put the um, selected Spanish language. <laughs> so that's a good way to motivate them to learn language and support of parents. And one last comment I have is developing an appreciation of another culture while reflecting on one's own. Yes. And I think with our students, sometimes that's where we have to start. So in this part two, we're going to look at lots of activities that mostly they're related to some Spanish activities, but they can be applied to any language in the classroom. But first, I have this graphic used with permission from the Keys to Planning for Learning, which is in the Eiffel book by Donna Clementi and Laura Terrell. And this is what first caught my eye with interculturality. So with a partner, create a Y chart. I don't know, you can imagine what a Y chart is, but in the middle you say, what do you see? Concrete, no interpretation, just concrete. What do you see? How do you interpret it? And then what questions do you have? So you have three different sections on a piece of paper. So with a partner, work on this for a little bit. What do you see? How do you interpret this? And what questions do you have? So we'll take about 40 seconds.
Oh, the yellow says exploring communities. Okay, oh, I gave you lots of extra time. So if you have any comments for your facilitator to type in, that would be great. You'll be seeing these words again in the next slide, the knowing myself, exploring communities and engaging with the world. We think this shows how one person can relate to their community and also the world. And in the middle, information, interpretation, interculturality. Ah, OK. You thought the I was for either information, interpretation, or interculturality. And yes, I will see what I can do to provide copies of the, the PowerPoint. This graphic is in the keys to planning for learning for the app in the actual document, in the actual book publication. It's also in the Entre Culturas teacher editions that they are sampling if you want to get this for yourself. All right, I is the intersection of everything. Oh, well, that's okay. That's great. I was actually supposed to be interculturality. That, that kind of was what inspired me to come up with the interculturality is at the heart of language learning. So, but obviously there's no real wrong answers when you're interpreting something like this and it's all related to the culture and the language and how you grow as you learn more about other cultures. So anyhow, I'm going to move on to the examples. How do you integrate interculturality in teaching and learning? Linguafolio put out a document in 2014 on intercultural can-dos it's not, it's different from what ACTFL and SESFL are working on together, but it was a beginning. And what I did like about that document is that it started with knowing myself. And basically, how can learners understand their own culture and use their language skills to identify and investigate products and practices of other cultures? This is so clear for all of us where our language learners start their language learning is they start with learning about products and then practices. And obviously, when they're learning about products and practices of other cultures, they're learning, they have to learn about their own first. So 
that is a great way to start with your students, no matter what you're doing, is to just get them thinking about, okay, what does this can of Slim Fast mean in your our culture or in our community? Because we have so many different cultures. And what does it tell you about your community or your culture? What, what does it value? So it gets at the perspectives. And then of course, when you talk about what other people eat for breakfast or snacks or whatever, then you get into, well, that's not so weird. I mean, maybe what we have is, is, is weird. So it just kind of gets them more like on a level playing field instead of them thinking something is strange or weird. What we do may seem weird to other people as well. You know, drinking a can of Slim Fast in your car as you go down the road 60 miles an hour. I know none of you have ever done that. So in any case, uh, this top bar here is an incorporation of the knowing myself by investigating, explaining, and reflecting. You've heard those words in the World Readiness Standards. Uncommon cultural products, in this case it's Spanish-speaking cultures, but other any other cultures, what would they be able to do? In this case, they were comparing differences between schools in their communities in Costa Rica. And this was their, my intercultural progress, similar to the lingua folios student progress, self-assessment of each student, self-assessment, and then providing evidence of what they can do. So, um, Entre Culturas created their own rendition of how to students could self-assess the different levels of interculturality at novice, basically novice and intermediate. So they would provide some evidence of how well they could do this, just like you did, you know, I can do this independently, I can do this with help, or I can't do this quite yet. They would decide how they do, and when they have evidence, they would upload it to their portfolios. And the same thing would be true of the second one, which is reflect, investigating, explaining, and reflecting on common practices. And this one had to do with recognize greeting and leave-taking norms in different, in this case, Spanish-speaking countries. So this is level one. This is novice level. This is what they can do that begins their quote-unquote path to interculturality. And I, these little purple clips are from the 21st century world language map. And they have great sample tasks and different proficiency levels for information literacy, financial literacy, civic, civic literacy. Anyhow, if, they're great little examples. You'd have to tweak them, but they're out there. It's referenced in the, ref, uh, the resources at the end, but it's in, on your handout page, on the last page. It's the, called the 21st, Partnership for 21st Century Skills Map, and I have the link. So you can find it very easily. So I clipped this novice range task, which I really liked, and then I thought, ooh, it doesn't, it's not very intercultural. So I'm going to read it to you because it is quite small text, font, and then your caveat is to adapt it to make it intercultural. So students browse the website of a current popular magazine in a target language country. So that's the product, the magazine. They identify the emotions of the people in the photos based on their interpretation of the visual and linguistic cues and then discuss their findings. So they're basically looking through a, a magazine, but they're discussing emotions because more than likely they would know in a novice level, you know, happy, sad, nervous, stressed out, those kinds of uh, adjectives to describe the photos in the magazine. But there really isn't anything intercultural about it. So instead of taking it out, how could you adapt this to make it intercultural from what you know so far? And take about just 20 seconds and see if somebody comes up with something that would make it intercultural.
Okay. Anybody have an idea? Talking about products, what do you do? Where do you start? I see someone is typing. I'll wait and see what they say. If not, we'll go on. In the meantime, the intermediate range one, I think, could be considered intercultural. Comparison, yes, you got it. UVA, comparison of L1 magazine to L2 magazine, absolutely. Great, that's all you would have to do to make it intercultural. So this just gives you an example of, you can take something that you might currently do and just add something to it to make them see the differences between the two cultures in terms of how the emotions of the people in the photos and gets them to go through and identify what their culture, what they see in their culture, and what they see in another culture. Great. Super. Okay. And the other one is to students write a short email describing their school's technology and appropriate use guidelines, and they ask students of a teacher in a target language country to describe the same at their school and discuss the similarities and differences. Yes, that's true. You can kind of, if you can't do that in real life, find a teacher in another country to share that with your students. You can, I'm sure, find similar things resource-wise of what it would look like and compare the similarities and differences. We have such a wealth of authentic sources at our hands. Okay, exploring communities. This one is the next level up from the knowing myself. It's just going out into your community. How can learners use their language skills to recognize, understand, and connect to other ways of thinking in their own community? So we have people in our own communities, probably in your own classrooms, that have a different ways of thinking. So the task is and I'll give you an example first, and then you can think of a task that leads students to engage them in trying new foods in order to experience another culture. And that is this uh, can-do statement. By demonstrating curiosity, open-mindedness, respect, tolerance, and empathy while exploring communities in order to gain a balanced understanding of other cultures, the can-do is I can recognize that food traditions and preferences are important to cultural identity and that trying new foods is a step to experiencing another culture. Again, that awareness is what we're trying to develop outside their own selves, you know, what it's like to experience another culture. So what is a context that would lead a task, that leads to a task to engage students to try new foods? What, what context would that look like in the classroom? And I know you all have great ideas for foods and trying out new foods in the classroom. Okay, if anybody is something, somebody's typing them in, we'll read them to you in a second, and then we will take a little break, as promised. It is something like eight minutes enough time for a break. As soon as we read what they are typing here, I'll start the timer. Or I can read them when you come back. Why don't you all take a break now and I'll read them when you come back from your break in eight minutes. So that would be 
You have about one more minute before we get started again. We're going to get started again. Okay. We're going to get started again with our webinar. I know everybody needs to get up and move around at the very least. So I had several ideas for a context to for students to try new foods. And one of them was that um, you can have students find people in their community to find out about different ways people handle food, interview community members regarding foods that are commonly consumed in their culture at different meal times, and compare them to our own meals, and that would be good for the community, comparing holiday food specials, specialties or the typical ingredients of a daily meal from different cultures, such as breakfast, knowing what foods to eat that are specific to holidays and special events. Great. All great ideas. Again, you know, it's whatever works and you hear an idea from someone else and you put yours together and it comes up with a better idea. So the, the deepest level would be engaging with the world. And this is how can learners use their language skills and cultural understanding to function in cultural contexts outside the classroom. And presumably, not just in the community, but maybe even in the actual country of the culture. And this, um, this one is based on an activity, this can-do statement. I can give examples of how international volunteers make a difference in Latin American communities. This is based on a, a level two, so it's like a novice, high, intermediate, low, examples of how international volunteers can make a difference in a Latin American community. The activity that's related to this can do deals with volunteerism and community service. Students read about a project in which the international volunteers participate in a project, in, in this case, a Nicaraguan community, and then they reflect on the ways that these individuals made a difference in those communities. So they're talking about volunteerism, they're reading about what they did in real life in a Nicaraguan community, and then they reflect on what they actually did to make a difference. So it's getting them to take themselves outside of their space and their community even, and engage with the world and see what's going on at that level. Examples here that would work, students explore an environmental issue in a target language country with a group of peers from that country, and together they propose solutions that are environmentally safe. That would work if you had contacts with that, or you can also find that information possibly in an audio or a video or a print text. In the advanced range, students investigate an immigration issue in the U.S. and a target language country, analyze and th synthesize the information, and propose a solution in the form of a letter to the editor. So that can be done basically just by investigating the target language country, making that analysis, and proposing a solution. So great ideas for you to take back to your classrooms. Um, here's some more activities that appear uh, in the, this one is from level one of Entre Culturas, since its focus is on interculturality. And this one, many everybody does the family. It's a universal. Whenever language you are teaching, you talk about the family and the relationships, the people in the family, the 
vocabulary and everything involved. So the cultural focus here is more on the last names of the uh, family members. The fact that they, the child takes the father's last name and the mother's last name, as this girl in the inset on the right-hand side of the page with the blue background. She explains in her little text what her name is. I'll show it to you in a minute in the larger font. She's got four names, you know, Maria Angeles Sanchez Millan. So, and then she goes on to explain that her first name, Maria Angeles, first and middle name, are from her grandmother and great-grandmother. And of course, then she has her father's name, then her mother's name. So it's asking students to understand how family and given names reflect identity in other cultures. Those names are very important. And it also asks the students to reflect on if they are named after family members of a previous generation. And how do names of their family members reflect family ties? So ask yourself, if you do these types of activities, what can you do to make it intercultural? And it might just be getting the students to reflect on their names so they can understand better how the names are given in other countries. And there may be more similarities than differences and how you fill out forms. They have a little form to fill out for the students in there. So I know and it's very hard because I don't get any feedback, audio or otherwise from you all, but I know someone would be asking me, well, what's the evidence? How can they show this evidence in the target language that they can understand that how family names are given da 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 to somebody? So I did insert a slide to show you what evidence in the portfolio would look like if you reflected on this intercultural can do if you reflect it using the target language, and again, it's level one, so they just know words and phrases. So they would basically write the name, Maria Angeles is her first and middle name, and the names of the, they, she gets them from her grandmother and great-grandmother. Sanchez is from her dad, and Millan is from her mom. And if they could do that, that is showing evidence that they understand how the people in other cultures, how their names relate to identities. So her whole family is kind of significant in the name that she has. So I just hope that's helpful in how students can reflect using the target language. We want them to, in level one and two, they reflect at home in English on some of the questions that they have but in the classroom, you want them using that target language. And we'll talk more about that. So now we have um, another activity of level one, because it has mostly English instructions. And the preparation part is looking at the picture first. We're not playing the video quite yet look at the picture and anticipate what kind of information you think she's included in her little video blog. It's about 57 seconds. And what do you think the phrases in the speech bubbles mean? So again, this is unit one, level one. We've talked about names. You can probably figure out what her name is, Maria Laura. If you don't know Spanish, you know Spanish or French, you can figure that out easily. Um, Paraguay, well, that probably means where she's from, which is true. And the violin, you see a picture of the violin, that's a cognate, so you probably think that she plays the violin, which is true. So it's all very comprehensible. But now we're gonna to listen to her speak and see what you can gather from what she speaks. And there are subtitles, but they're in Spanish. So just see what you can get out of it and we'll take it from there. Hola, mi nombre es María Laura, tengo 17 años, soy de Paraguay, hablo dos idiomas, guaraní y castellano. Una frase en guaraní podría ser, ¿Cuánta tema fue la historia? Lo vamos a estar raza guaraní. 
que traducido al castellano sería Ahora ya puede decir la historia y no va a terminar la raza guaraní. Esta frase es de una música paraguaya. Mi papá se llama Elvio, mi mamá se llama Cipriana y tengo una hermana que se llama María José. Eh, tengo un perro que se llama Stevie y me gusta tocar el violín. Integro una orquesta y para poder a practicar debo viajar 5 kilómetros y lo hago en mi moto. Saludos a todos y hasta la próxima. Great. And even if you didn't know Spanish, I was hoping that maybe you could get some ideas of what she was saying. I know it was probably a surprise to hear her speaking in Guarani, but that's an indigenous language in Paraguay. And it's interesting that her family preserves that. She's from a rural area in Paraguay. So how is this activity similar or different? Well, let's talk about this first. They would do a comparison after they watched the video, Paso 4 up here on the right. It says, how is Maria Laura similar to you and are other young people in your community? How is she different? And then you share your observations in class because the can do statement says, I can recognize some similarities and differences between a Paraguayan teen and myself. Again, we want students to identify with other students adolescents that are their age that speak obviously another language, the language that they're studying, the Spanish, but also the fact that this girl is bilingual also, but she's bilingual in Spanish and Guarani. So just with the, what you saw, what do you, how is this activity similar or different from what you usually do when you're teaching about students or adolescents from other countries and what they like to do, which you always do in level one, likes and dislikes and where you're from. How is this similar or different? Just turn and talk for like 15, 20 seconds. Okay, so I hope it's very similar, but now you know what maybe you can do to tweak some of your activities to just make it a little bit more intercultural so that there's an identification there of someone in the other culture that they can identify with. All right, lots more activities coming up here. Um, this one is a text messaging activity, and this passage here is giving you some equivalents of words and how they're used in a text message. So we're not going to go through all that. But with this, you could actually have your students try texting someone else in the classroom and sending a message to a friend and making plans, can they communicate using this chat language? So the reflection here is, write a list of five or six expressions and shortcuts used when texting in English first. That's your kind of connecting to what you already do. Are there rules or patterns, like we have up here in the Spanish one? Do you think text would be an easy way to communicate with Spanish speakers, why or why not? And they could, compare what, you know, like if you're saying hello, it is like here over here in the right hand margin, hola, O-L-A versus H-O-L-A. And then of course, sometimes they misspell things and they extended hola, que pasa, what's going on, que tal, the K, the Q stands for K, which means what. And this one I really like because it says, um, Uf, estudiando como un loco. So he's saying, how are you? And they're saying, studying como, like as a crazy person, but they used the word one because it's the same as saying one. And we say a crazy person, but they say like one crazy person, so they use the digit 
one. So it's just a fun way to get students to think of communicating in a different language. And the can-do statement was, I can understand basic conventions for communicating in different media like text messages. So it's just basically an understanding, you know, how they use that uh, language for texting and if there's some kind of relationship that makes it uh, pa patterns that make it more conventional than just random, which I think we do too. I'll never forget the first time I learned LOL. <laughs> So now we are going to sh showcase this activity that I found on the creative language class. And I also uh, read her blog, and this was Megan Smith from Creative Language Math, uh, Creative Language class. And her, this is her thought process, which I thought was really interesting. She said, this is the family unit, and sometimes they don't like to talk about family. So she tried to take it from a different perspective and talk about games that families and other cultures play. So we, they got off, you know, in terms of like relationships and things like that in the family and just focused on the games that people play in families. And then they learned about culture in terms of the games they play. And they, and the students were allowed to investigate different games and choose one and whatever. So. She um, talked about when they play games, where, why, they like certain games, and who's the most competitive person in our family. So it was more like just activating their background knowledge. When she asked them about traditional Hispanic games, soccer was their best answer. So she knew they were going to learn a lot. So she found these at a market, and she was dying to use them in her classroom. So she set up stations for Domino's Lottery and the Perinola, which is like the spinning top. So they had stations and they had three questions at each station they had to answer. And then they had 15 minutes to investigate so that they could learn how to play the game, which I thought was interesting. They had to look it up, which is investigation, which is great with culture. It's investigating investigation of products and practices. And then they jumped right in and started to divide up the research. They started playing and arguing about game rules and each group did their own thing and it looked messy. But she saw collaboration and teamwork and problem solving. And then she watched them play the game. And then when they wanted to play it again, she got somebody to play the person that called out the numbers and I'm going to show you a clip that she put on her website. And this is a real authentic native speaker person calling out the words and this is how it's really done. <laughs> so anyhow the student it looked like they were playing this at lunchtime or something but in any case they loved playing and they had to be so fast so they learned how to communicate on new topics and learned culture about the games and brought it back to themselves and you know how they play games in the United States they had to ask answer these questions these were the questions asked in the target language which game was the most complicated which one was simple which one is popular Mexico Venezuela where did dominoes come from which is your favorite and why so they are bringing that back into the target language 
but that is a great hands-on way to teach them culture, that's for sure. Okay, so in the intermediate classroom, we have, there's a unit on healthcare, and it involves a unit on Cuba and several activities focused on how food can help health issues. And the learning target is to describe and compare homemade remedies in Cuba with those in your community. So prior to this reflection and can do a self-assessment, they read a letter from a grandmother who provided her homemade remedies for different illnesses. They also saw a video on how to prepare some of these homemade remedies. The reflection again, the very detailed, it's in English. They're asked to reflect in home in a journal, interactive journal or whatever, reflect at home in English. But when they come to class, they're more prepared to use the target language because at least they thought about their opinions and what they think and prior to coming to class. And then they might compare some of the traditional remedies that they've learned in class compared to some of the home remedies they might use at home, like, you know, aspirin or, you know, antibiotic or whatever types of things that could be cognates for them. So it, it is challenging for the students, but again, it probably has to be, it has to be scaffolded and built up over the year. Another activity is, and I really wanted to showcase this one because it is talking about um, community-based tourism. And it's in a unit on travel, but the focus is on culturally responsible and sensitive tourism and how do travel experiences shape our intercultural understanding and respect for the communities we visit. So not what we can get out of it, but what we can learn in terms of respecting the communities that we visit. So you start out with a connection to themselves over here on the left. What types of tourism are you familiar with? What do you think about community-based tourism? How do you think it's different from typical tourism that normally people travel when they travel? Which one would you think would be best for the communities? So they, the whole purpose, the premise of this is that the community-based tourism that they have is sustainable tourism where tourists experience the community life of the target culture. Tourists participate in everyday activities, observe customs, stay in family homes, help prepare food, and learn about the work by farmers and artisans of the community. So the question is, what can you learn about yourself and another culture when you're traveling? So, and the can-do question is, I can describe how to show respect and understanding in community-based tourism because all the activities and the videos in this case talk about have the people in those communities, in this case, an indigenous community in Argentina, talking about why it's important to show people your country and your culture, but being responsible and respectful as a tourist. So it's just a little different play on the travel unit, you know, where you go and see different countries and monuments and things like that, which you still do, but this is a, a different aspect of it. And again, it plays into that, those attitudes of interculturality, being open-minded, showing respect, appreciation, tolerance, and empathy for the people that you're communicating with. So that's why the uh, focus is so interesting. Okay, it's time for you to look at three different handouts in your packet. Um, there's one, a novice intercultural communication and reflection activity, which looks like this. There is a intermediate one and a advanced one. So with, in a small group, choose one, just choose it at random, and then review it, examine it, and tell me what you notice, how is it scaffolded, at what points do the students use the target language, and how 
would you do something like this in your classroom? Because everything comes down to your being able to connect to some of these activities and how you could do them in your classroom. So let's try to do two minutes. And while you're doing this, you can be internalizing how you would adapt it for your classroom. So I'm going to give you two minutes. Okay, sorry, time is up, but we're um, com this is the end of our part two, and I do want to get to part three. So we're not going to share out on this particular one, and you all have the uh, copies. These are, again, I want to reiterate that these are drafts from the Necessful Actful Can Do's for intercultural communication. So these, again, are draft form only. I was able to use them with permission by citing the fact that they are drafts. They have not been released yet. So, but it will, you can start thinking about how maybe next year you would want to include some of these types of intercultural communication and reflection activities in your um, classrooms. So at the end of part two, we are going to assess, self-assess. Can you provide examples of intercultural activities for learners to engage in cultural observations, investigations, and reflections that promote intercultural awareness and interactions? And to provide evidence, which activities for you best modeled how to integrate interculturality into your classroom? It could be all of them or none of them, but hopefully some of them. So just share that really quickly with um, a partner in like 10 seconds. Okay, oops, 10 seconds is up. All right, part three. We are coming to the last part. It's actually the shortest part, but probably um, this is the part you're most interested in because it has the drafts of the can-do statements that I can't give to you yet because they are um, in draft form. But how can teachers guide learners to develop interculturality? You've seen lots of sample activities, which are really the basis for how you would do it in the classroom. 
But in this component, you're going to review and analyze a set of sample learning tasks that can be adapted to individual learning contexts. And hopefully by the end of this component, you will be able to customize some of these can-do statements for intercultural communication for the content and context for the targeted professional level for your classroom. And just as an aside, I'm not great at finding comics. I have colleagues that are much better at this than I am. But I saw this one about language fluency. And she had all these great things like, I'm, I'm comfortable and I'm not terrified. I know how to respond to something unexpected. I don't translate or wonder what verb form to use. I can relate, communicate, and connect with others. It feels intuitive, unconscious, and smooth. I'm thinking, yeah, that's language fluency, but where's the intercultural connection? So I added, but now I can interact and behave in culturally appropriate ways. So that's what we're trying to foster here in this uh, concept of interculturality. So to give you a preview of what these are about and how they're organized is that there are two main competencies for interculturality and they were actually featured on the activities that you saw. You saw one that said investigate at the for the learning target and you saw one that said interact. So this competency here on this little clip out here says investigate products and practices to understand perspectives. Investigation of products and practices to understand perspectives. The other competency is interaction in another culture. And that's when you bring the behaviors come into play. The way you dress, the way you act, the what you do, your nonverbal language. So it's, yes, it's the products and practices and perspectives, but it's also those behaviors and what it looks like, language and behaviors. So that's different. That is something new, I think, for most of us. We show them how to meet and greet and, you know, kiss on two cheeks or three, you know, two kisses versus three kisses, you know, those types of things. But we, this is something that we need to model and show them other behaviors as well. So. This is how they're organized. There's competencies. The competencies, competencies that I mentioned are the investigation of the products and practices to understand perspectives and interact in another culture. Then they have benchmarks, and that's going to be the uh, right up here at the top for novice. And that says, in my own and other cultures, and all of them are preceded in this particular competency by in my own and other cultures. So it's right there for you it's in your face it's in the kid's face i can identify products and practices to help me understand perspectives so to me i think that's really helpful to have this type of language and i'm hoping that they will be out in august before you come back to school so you can incorporate them then you have an indicator and this one breaks it down into just the products and I own in other cultures, I can identify some typical products related to daily life. In the intermediate level, and it's not broken down into sub-levels, it's just holistic novice, holistic intermediate, holistic advanced. And my own in other cultures, I can compare products related to everyday life and personal interests or studies. So it goes up the proficiency scale because obviously you are communicating this in the target language. Then they provide some customized learning tasks that probably a novice person would do, like this first one says, which was related to the first task that you saw, uh, intercultural communication activity. I can identify locations to buy something and how culture affects where people shop. Versus when you go to the intermediate, I can compare how and why houses, buildings, and towns affect lifestyles. And then at the advanced level, you can describe the cultural influences on the design of houses, buildings, and towns that might come from another culture, for example. Then, so it's very important to know what the tool is used, what the tool is, and what the tool is not. So I'm going to share that with you 
this part I just shared with you on the pre prior slide, what, how it's broken down so that you could see that together on the overlay. It's a set of sample learning tasks that can be adapted to a school or district curriculum as well as independent learning goals. It's one step in the process to develop the communicative aspect of intercultural communicative competence in a learned language. And some of this might still be edited, so it's not final. And it's a starting point for self-assessment, goal setting, and also for rubrics for performance-based grading. So I'm, we're very grateful to Ms. Espel and Apple, this task force that is working on the these documents because we have our great task force that is coming up with super helpful scaffolded materials for teachers and languages to use. This is not a checklist of tasks to be demonstrated once and checked off. So obviously it's something that needs to be spiraled in and out of your curriculum throughout the year, most likely. It's not a prescri prescribed curriculum but they offer samples that can be modified or elaborated depending on your curriculum. It's not a comprehensive intercultural communicative competence program. That's not really what we're about here. We're about integrating this interculturality, intercultural communication into our classrooms to help students become more competently and culturally appropriate ways. And it's not an instrument for grades either at all. It's growth and inter, it's not growth. It shows growth and in intercultural communication as measured over time. When they have these opportunities in performance assessments and they're evaluated with proficiency based rubrics. So I call it the path to intercultural communication because it's basically just, it is communication using language, but it also is showing what you can do. So I don't know how well you can see this, but it's basically, um, think of a thematic context that in which you could integrate one of these tasks. I can't make this any bigger right now, but there is one in the, um, let's see. Oh, I know, it's in your handout. If you look on your handout on page three, I knew you couldn't read them, so I put them in the handout, a couple of them. So there's a novice, intermediate, and advanced customized sample learning in the middle of the page. It's in the fourth row down. So identify one of those and see if you could integrate that into one of your classes that you currently teach. So take a couple minutes, choose with one level, and see how you could integrate that into something that you already teach. I'm seeing shopping, I'm seeing community, themes, architecture, community planning, Oh, I'm sorry, I just saw this. I think somebody wanted to go back to one of these. If not, previous sample activity slide. I, I'm sorry, I missed someone's message in the chat bar. Okay, let's stop there. There, okay, sorry, thank you. Sorry about that. So 
I'm sure you thought of some place where you could use something like this, and if not, you would be able to modify it to fit your curriculum. And that's the purpose of these documents. And I will give you an example of the, um, oops, sorry, I want to give you an example of the rehearsed behaviors. Reflecting on interacting in another culture. It says I can use appropriate rehearsed behaviors. If you go to page four in your handout, third row down, it says I can use appropriate rehearsed behaviors in familiar situations and recognize some obviously inappropriate behaviors for novice. Intermediate, I can recognize significant that significant differences in behaviors exist among cultures and use appropriate learned behaviors to avoid major taboos. And in advance, they are aware of subtle differences and they adjust their behavior in familiar and some unfamiliar situations. So some examples would be that you can use rehearsed behaviors when purchasing items. You can use learned behaviors when visiting someone's home and or business and when you notice when you make a mistake. I did notice when I made a mistake with my behavior. And I can adjust my personal space and body language accordingly when interacting with others in a business school or work environment. So what thematic context, in which thematic context could you use that in one of your classes? This, I think, is one of the more challenging aspects of the intercultural can-dos is knowing how to integrate these behaviors into your lessons and getting that message across. This is where I think videos come in handy to be able to show them or if you have access to people of the culture that you teach that can come and show some of those behaviors or demonstrate that. Okay, so at this point, I gave you a preview of all those beautiful can-dos, and they are going to be phenomenal and help us a lot with what we do and how we integrate interculturality or intercultural, intercultural communication into our lessons and activities for our classrooms. I hope you can think of something you would like to do. Maybe you were inspired by one of these activities and you're thinking, oh, I can do that and tweak it to use it for your own classroom. So at this time, if you would do the self-assessment on your handout for the last part of how do the cultural can do statements for intercultural communication support your ability to integrate interculturality in your lessons? So how would they, let's put it that way, how would they help support you? And can you do this on your own, or do you need help, or you cannot do this yet? And finally, I these I will definitely get to you, uh, the resources and the links. And before we leave today, and I will ask you if you have any questions as well, uh, 
I do want to acknowledge some people that have been very generous with their um, work and their work in our field. And that's um, Paul Sandrock at Actual. He's been a very big guide for me and all that I've been doing. And also to Donna and Laura for their keys to planning for learning and giving us permission for their graphic. Uh, Mara Kobe, who presented the interculturality webinar for NADSFL. Jackie Van Houten from Jefferson County, Kentucky, who has been a visionary in the field in terms of developing and leading this whole process of interculturality and many other things. And this, the task force that is developing these can-dos, including Ruta Kuit, who has been also a guide and very helpful in leading me down the right path of being able to share these documents with you today. So as we um, get ready to leave, if you have any questions, whoops, I have something to show you at the end. Ah, there we go. Um, it's been a pleasure connecting with you. And yeah, I hope you've been able to collaborate and work together today in this webinar. I hopefully you've had some people to work with. I remember one time when I was on the only sole person at the participant at the webinar. But in any case, uh, it's been a pleasure. And I think our time is almost up. I think we're all ready to breathe <laughs> and uh, stand up and, and get going home. It's, you know, after a very long day. So any questions would be more than welcome. My information, my email is on the first page of your handouts. Janet Parker 136 at gmail.com. I will check my email if you have any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you as well. And yes, these can do statements will be amazing and transformational. And you guys, along with many other people, are know they're coming out and you can't wait for them. And um, we have some resources out there that also will support you as well. So some of the activities that I shared with you. So with that, I, I think we're finished. I didn't go to exactly 6 o'clock, but I think that's OK. So I'm going to close out here. Yeah, this, the slide of the shans shaking is on a free website. I can get it for you in a second. called Pixobay. I'll copy it and put it up there, but I don't the facilitator can give it to you. It's Pixabay. That's the site for the free photos, many of which I used.